go live yes we are live now okay okay we are live and yet i can't see the cross posting button anywhere <laughs> so i really live, don't know live. cross post this yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's okay it's okay let's just do let's just do it from your facebook page okay um i'll figure out how to cross post it to your page in the future but hey how's everyone doing i've been hi if you can hear us sorry for being a bit late uh, because we were setting up just now but i think today is a very interesting day in the market um, blood on the street yes right? and um, despite yesterday super super good result from you know yesterday yet the share price of the glove counters actually kept dropping until now so yeah, Ming Tech, why is that? Why is that, Ming Tech? Before you ask me, I want to ask you first. <laughs> uh, why? You ask me why is the sh uh, share price dropping, is it? For the glove yeah. counters? We yeah, have uh, Michael Chan here saying hello. Hello, hi, everyone. Why. <laughs> Don't know why. I may say hello, Rondi and Ming Tech. Vincent say hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, so, why? I also don't know. Eh? Um, in fact, today I actually asked Lucas. Okay, today I uh, sent a message to Lucas. There's a new term mm. now in the market. I wonder whether you uh, you are aware of that. There's a new term called Hood Nine E. Have you seen this term before? Hood Nine E. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I have seen it um, recently. Uh, it's only like uh, the past one week or something. <laughs> yeah, you know what it means or not? <laughs> I do. I do. Yeah. Um, my Chinese is not good, but it's not that bad also. Lah. <laughs> this is actually uh, Hokkien a bit. Eh? So, yeah. it could count, yeah, this one means... Uh, so, I asked Lucas, hey, Lucas, Supermax, they all come out with so good result, then talk about want to do face masks, then put what ASP not factor in yet. Then, if we look at the earning per share, it's like 30 cents for this quarter. That means... Uh, mm. Even without factoring in any additional ASP increase, uh, it's gonna be one ringgit twenty cent earning per share for yep. Supermax. <clears throat> Even a P of ten, uh, this share is gonna be like twelve dollar. Yep. Right. So th there's like almost a fifty percent upside from here. Uh, looking from if we use a P of ten, uh, mm -hmm. which is super super reasonable. If you know this is a long term trend, it's gonna be twenty thirty one. By right. Yeah, but. Yep. In market, the market as a whole, uh, maybe they have a different thoughts. Uh, but later, I'll share more on that. Hey, guys, uh, we have 177 uh, uh, viewers and live attendees here. Type in super if you want to hear super good content here. right? Type in super. If we can hit 400, uh, then we will be really, really happy. Uh. If every time consistently 400, uh, I can bring a lot of super good guests for you, including Rondi. So, Stephen Tung here asks, good evening, Ron, uh, Rondi and Mingte. Hey, good evening to you too, Stephen. Good evening, guys. So I, I, I'm aware that uh, Stockbit posted on Hata result uh, and also posted on Supermax result. Um, yes. And uh, now I, I know what you guys mean by, you know, once the skeptics see the result, they may mm. change the view. Yeah, I'm yep. one of you. I never expected the earnings to go up mm. 30 times, you know. This is mm. like... Unbelievable, man. Uh, crazy, but lucky right? for me, yeah, it's like crazy. But lucky for me, the share price hasn't shoot up yet. Lah. So if I want to collect, I can. And now mm. uh, I'm no longer such a big bear on the glove. Uh, so so I, 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 I understand that you, I went um, to listen to one of your Facebook live and mm. you mentioned that you're finally um, going long on on rubber glove, is it? You, you bought yeah, the yeah. first is it? Yeah, I bought Riverstone um, in September when it was three something, oh, three fifty, three thirty. Okay, <laughs> okay la, not a super good gain also la, but uh, it's not it's, bad, right? It's sing dollar. It's a, <laughs> it's a good price because um, I mean, I think in the beginning it was uh, from May. It went to it went from one to about I don't know. I think there has been like two recent uh, corrections. So you got in at the second or third correction, I suppose. Yep. Mm. Uh, yep. Yep. Hey, can everybody press the love button so that you can reach more people? Because today's conversation is gonna be super, super interesting. Um, it's all about glove and then some tech counters 
and I'll be sharing some interesting tech counters uh, that I myself uh, am buying, right? So yeah. <clears throat> Hold on, uh, let me just. Um... So today, guys, um, how many of you got stuck in the uh, rubber glove counters? Those from Facebook, how many of you got stuck on rubber glove counters? Type in stuck. Actually, uh, Lucas, uh, today Lucas has shared with me something. Can you share with me? Hey, luckily we did the price in tutorial because last Sunday, Lucas mm -hmm. came on my Facebook live and he shared this thing called price in. That means sometimes our uh, share price already go up so much uh, when they mm -hmm. actually receive the good result, the share price actually dropped. Right? Just like JF Tech, right? JF Tech went from very, very low price. How many of you bought JF Tech? Type in JF, right? And then it shoot up like double, triple. I think in fact, the share price went up fivefold. Um, mm. Then after that, um, this JF Tech, after they released the news of Huawei partnership, the share price is dropping. So in fact, a lot of people already know about this Huawei thing. Uh. I don't know, lah. maybe they were rumors or what. So they bought in and they, you know, going the stock up. Uh. Then mm. once the official news is released, people start taking profit. And I believe this could be the same thing that is happening to the glove counters over and over again. Yeah. yeah. I don't I don't yeah. I don't really agree with that actually, Ming Tech. Yeah. I think um, with glove, um, it is not I mean, yeah, fine. In terms of the result, uh, it is uh, you know, people can predict it and some people will get it right and some people will get it wrong, right? Um, but I believe that the market for the gloves are so big that it is not easy to manipulate. So I would say that um, the price movements of gloves is very much on sentiment base and it's very much on fund flows uh, base. You know, if, if let's say the um, if let's say the uh, the institution starts buying and then it will move up. If the retailer starts selling, it will move down. Uh, yeah, it's it's more it's more dynamic than just insider information and what information that I have before the market knows and and all these sort of things. Yeah, but I, I do agree. Agree that. I do agree yeah. that um, in Malaysia, especially yeah. this year, there uh, there has been just too many instances where um, other counters, not the rubber gloves, other mm -hmm. counters, um, it is just. Uh, people with insider or rather like privileged information, you know, they they just go rank the stock up and once the result is, is out and then they just sell on news. Yes. Yeah. Hold on, um, I'm looking into a uh, uh, hey? cross post share uh, to any place. Oh, wait, wait, I think we can see. Oh, I found a cross posting button, man. Ah, we okay. Have live on pages, yeah. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Okay. okay good. Thanks. Now we can. Now that we got all the tech thing out of the way, we can focus fully on discussion on stocks. Actually, I got a special thoughts on stocks. You know, on on glove stocks as to mm -hmm. why we drop But actually, this is just gossip only lah. Just talk for fun only. Don't read too much sure. into it lah. Uh, and yeah, in yeah. fact, counterproductive to always speculate on why the share price drop. Sometimes it just drop. Because of no reason, the market just want to give you bargain. But um, maybe do you follow uh, our ex 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 prime minister now the Facebook page? Uh, no, I don't. But I know that recently he's been talking about gloves. Uh. <laughs> yep. But yeah, what 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 what, it, uh, what does his Facebook page? How does that link to rubber gloves? Yeah. So this is what I think. Uh. So uh, let, let maybe let me. Let me share my screen uh, on this page. Let's make him more famous. Um, I'll share the screen and we have a read together. Najib Razak. Okay. Yep. So um, in his post, he's typing in Malay. I think you can read, right? You're from Indonesia. Yeah. Okay. He said the popular profit went up 18 fold, right? Compared to last year. And then um, now it's almost. Is even higher than Tanaga, right? Mm. And uh, they use the money to buy back shares and Supermax as well, right? And now he's like, you can see from his message, uh, he's sort of like targeting them already because he's saying they are buying back the share to benefit shareholder, but not the, mm. not the um, masyarakat is what? Community, not mm. the community. 
And I plead these companies to do more CSR, to mm. contribute their money to COVID Malaysia. Mm. You know, it gives a little bit of indication that, you know, they think these, kind, these companies are making too much money mm. and uh, they give a little bit back. I think this is uh, one of the big worry. Uh. If like they really all factors and all that, yeah, is it possible? And this is not speculation, or this is already expressed an interest. And we all know how powerful he is, uh, in, in the back yeah. scene. Yeah, I think, um, okay, maybe the first topic that we should talk about today is perhaps let's talk about gloves, right? Mm. Um, so I think let's just lay down, uh, let's just lay down everything, um, now with regards to glove, like what are the pros and cons of investing in glove, right? Sure. You Maybe you start first? Yeah. So, you know, I think I think it's very, very well documented. Uh, you know, there are def uh, there, there is there is basically those people that goes for glove and there are people that goes against glove. And it has become like um, an argument now, you know, um, Last time it used to be, oh, technical analysis is better than fundamental analysis. But now the argument in the market is like, yeah, glove is going to keep going up. And on the other side, it's like, no way, glove is just is just gonna be going down, right? So let me just lay down the, the, the reasons on each kind of like side. So for you, if let's say you are a, a glove bull, right? So these are the basically the arguments. Number one is that um, you know, they have a very clear earnings visibility for the next um, four quarters. I would say, I think if I'm not mistaken, the latest result is saying it, there is going to be a, a clear earnings visibility all the way until the end of next year. And the order book is that, that full. Means if let's say you order today, you are only going to get your gloves like at the end of next year. So that's number one, right? It's record earnings for the next four quarters and then other than that um when people are ordering the glove they have to pay up front so there is basically a huge windfall of cash into the glove counters so that's number two there is a huge cash in hand right uh, because the deposits have to be paid for you to confirm your order so that's number two so you're like already a bank you know um all these rubber glove players they have cash amount that are probably you know it's 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 crazy it's ne um, negative working capital right yeah. and then number three it's basically what what are you going to do with this cash you know uh, is there gonna be an increment in uh, dividend yeah perhaps so it could be a yield play as well and then number four is average selling price average selling price um, if I'm not mistaken until today it has not come down yet it has always and it it is it has been continuing to go up. If I'm not mistaken, it has actually slowed down for a little bit. The growth has slowed down, but due to the global um, spike of COVID again, it is actually now back up and it's accelerating again in terms of the increment of average selling price. Okay, and of course, all these glove players, they are adding more capacity. Okay, and other than that, um, what, what other thing is there? Um, yeah, and of course, even after COVID is, um, if even let's say let's just say the vaccine is found, the demand for gloves are still going to be high because there is going to be people that administer the vaccine, and for you to administer the vaccine, you still need gloves, right? And lastly, is even let's just say after the vaccine is out, um, there is going to be already um, like a change of behavior in in the global population and their hygiene awareness. So these are basically the case for gloves, I would say, right? Now, on the other side, it's basically people are talking about, okay, no, uh, you know, those are, yeah, those are good valid points, but these are my points, all right? So number one, of course, whenever the vaccine news is out, as you can see from Russian vaccine, la, China vaccine, la, it always kind of like um, reduce or rather it, it, it leads to a reduction in the, in the glove prices because these are sort of news that is detrimental to the prices of gloves. So that's number one. If let's say the vaccine approved, then the time frame of your average selling price, number two, is going to slow down and it's going to reduce. And then um, basically it's going to normalize. La. The average selling price is not going to keep going up. Your super normal profit finally stops, finally stops at the level. 
And then, of course, other than that is um, some some people are, are still arguing that, oh, you know, these glove counters are still expensive. But, but I mean, for that, I can actually argue, like, I don't personally think that um, the glove counters are expensive right now. Um, but yeah, some people are still saying that it is expensive. Next is uh, basically the, the shortage of supply of the butadine rubber, right? Nitrile butadine rubber. So that is going to be a potential of, you know, a higher raw material cost and, and, and that. And then after that is oversupply of glove um, because all these new entrants are coming in. The other day I was just doing a the other day I was just doing a breakdown of all these rubber glove wannabes in Malaysia, right? All these counters that had decided to go into gloves, and there are there are easily fifteen names, and I'm sure that more are going to come. So um, these are the sort of like the oversupply uh, argument. Um, yeah, so these are basically the case against gloves, right? And of course, there is another one which is saying that, um, yeah, those are the things, the other things such as uh, the labor la, and the windfall tax la, and maybe a strong, uh, a, a weaker US dollars, la, all these sort of things. And with all these two cases of uh, whether you are for gloves or against gloves, at the end of the day, you have to decide for yourself which, which side are you on. Yeah. Yep. But I think for me, for me personally, um, I have been talking about gloves, you can see in Talkbit as well, all the way from, from January. Um, even when we had Facebook Live, I think back in April or May, I was, I was like hopping on about gloves, right? I was telling you, hey, Mengtik, go and buy uh, Riverstone. It's only one one point one eight million dollars. <laughs> Things a long time. I'm like, ah, okay, let me monitor a bit first. Let me see this yeah. story. And then the time where I actually enter is like three point three. I'm like, when yeah. it goes to four something, I'm like, ah, oh, I'm so stupid, man. <laughs> then when mm. it drops to three point something, I'm like, this is my chance, right? Um, yeah. So yeah. I have been talking about gloves all the way from January, and it really has gone through uh, various cycles, lah. I feel like. I have actually learned a lot uh, in this short span of time. Um, you know, I have never experienced such a bull in my life. Um, yeah, but at, at where we are currently, um, I think there is definitely a case still for glove. I'm actually, if let's say there is a barometer on whether you're bearish of glove, which is zero, and I'm bullish of glove, which is like 10, I would say that I'm probably sitting at about 7.5, right? Wow. And I think from the very beginning, I have always mentioned that glove is um, it's, uh, it's like a sector and the counters are those counters that you need to have in your portfolio um, and that this is basically a thematic investment, right? This is a thematic investment. Um, but again, I, I am not, I'm not one of those crazy people. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not really like 10 out of 10 bullish on glove where I don't think that you should always keep your glove and don't sell it. I always, um, I feel like, um, yes, you can, you should be invested in glove. You should actually have two portfolios, in my opinion. I have always told my friends this, like, you should actually have two portfolios in gloves. One is like those hold to maturity portfolio, and the other one is like those asset for sale portfolio, in a sense that, yeah, you can actually buy low, sell, sell high, buy low, sell high. Um, and trading on fear and greed, you know, uh, that is on the on the trading part. But there should be always a portion of your portfolio that is invested in glove for the longer term, for the medium to long term, based on the yep. theme. Yep. Yeah. I agree. Um, actually, I, I don't have much comment now lah, because uh, seeing the profit uh, of those glove companies, uh, especially Supermax, really is unexpectedly high. Mm -hmm. um, if they can sustain like this for three, four years, I think even now, even let's say uh, in the bad case where after this COVID situation, after the vaccine, the profit goes back to the past. Uh, I think yeah. this current price is still not very, very overvalued mm. because of the big profit they are, that they are making. Uh, if we look at it, uh, the earning per share now um, compared to the share price, the PE mm. ratio is five to six only. So do you think they can sustain this profit for the next two, three years? It's pretty much secure, Adima, isn't it? Um, 
You mean like the supernatural, uh, the supernormal profit, is it? Supernormal profit, I believe they can still sustain it. Definitely for 2021, they can. Mm -hmm. I feel like 2022, um, it's still very cloudy, but I would I would say that they will still have super, no super normal profit. But whether it is going to be better than 2021, I, to be honest, uh, I am not too sure. I'm not too right. sure. Well, but there's is definitely going to be a plateau. There's going to be a level where the average selling price uh, stop increasing. Uh. But if everybody is going to go and get the vaccine, uh, isn't the usage going to be even much higher than now? Yes, I think so. So for instance, if let's say, let's just assume that there's a vaccine by um, beginning of um, next year. Lah. Um, and, you know, once there's a vaccine, I think what is going to happen is average selling price is going to either slow down or it is going to st be stagnant and over time it's going to drop, right? Because there is finally an end to the pandemic or rather people perceive there is going to be an end to the pandemic. Um, and then what, what is going to happen subsequently is that now um, all the people in the world have to be, um, you know, they, they, need to get the vac they, they need to get vaccinated. And in order for you to do that, you actually still need gloves. So the glove demand is still going to sustain for a long period of time. But it's just that the average selling price is not going to be um, keep going up. So yeah, there is definitely going to be super normal profit <clears throat> still. Yeah. And um, my view now is, um, if you ask me long term wise, uh, if we buy at this price, uh, it actually depends on what counter. So I don't know about all the mm. counters. I only know about Riverstone. Supermax at this current price, especially Riverstone, it's, it only triple ma, triple a bit only ma, right? So it, it's the counter that hasn't go up the most, and yet they have been consistently even before this COVID uh, scaling up their operation, right? So mm. and based on the investor briefing last time, they are able to increase the average selling price every single month. I forgot mm -hmm. the name. For every every two weeks they are increasing it, and that hasn't even been factored into the result yet. So. If you look at the profit that they'll make in the next few years, uh, I think that profit itself could cover the share price increase. Just based on the cash value itself, uh, could cover a big portion of the share price increase. So it's actually uh, the safety there. Really? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I'm not too sure about that. I think I think the number of cash that they're going to receive as compared to the market cap, it's still a very, very big gap. You know, there, there is still going to be a very big gap there. But yeah, I mean, I, I agree with your points. Uh, but I mean, yeah, I'm just wondering, uh, you know, would you actually be buying Supermax because it's a cheaper stock right now? Okay, I'll share with you. My mm. point of view is, um, Glove for me now is still something that I will use it for trading. Yep. Because um, what I'm afraid of, because I don't buy in into the super long term theory. I'll buy yep. in a two, three years um, thematic story, right? So if it's only for two, three years, um, it's very hard to tell how the market will react, right? Let's say if the market, those big, super big fund, they are already pricing in th things that will be happening, the value five years from now, right? Mm -hmm. Even though they are still having the profit growth, all this, but they're already pricing in the potential ASP drop, right? So I, I, I've been through some some training done by a fund manager, uh, UOBK, and mm -hmm. I don't want to mention which fund manager, even that fund manager, mm -hmm. he is, you know, glove now is very dangerous. Um, so this means the fund manager from these kind of companies, um, they are wary of the glove stocks as well. Even though yeah, by right, they should be adding, let's say, for portfolio management, but they are wary of the high valuation as well. But mm -hmm. going back to the point just now where I say a huge chunk of their share price uh, will be in cash value. Idea. It, you just look at Supermax. Uh, Supermax yep. has a PE of, uh, PE of uh, let's, let's say right now, price is $8. They are making yep. $1.20 and it's all cash, right? So yep. if you if they can do this for two, three years, right? That's three ringgit 60 cent cash value from the eight ringgit share price. Yeah, and it will reduce the PE ratio. La. I mean, the X cash yeah. PE ratio will reduce for sure. Yeah, the PE over EBITDA is only like, I mean, the, the real price that you're paying is like $4 something. Mm -hmm. for the long-term business so i think it's not that not that expensive when you look at it that way now mm. when you look at it that way not that expensive and um but if you ask me keep for long term will, am i sure to make a lot of money from it it's very uncertain for me 
But I do think that this top right now at this current valuation with the, the team, all this, still got room to go on. Okay, I personally think, but the, the entry point is important. No? So my strategy is different. I look at it more from, okay, FA-wise, I think no problem, at least super max. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's definitely, I must look at the TA. Whenever it shows this is downtrend and bearish, get out. When, when it starts to show sideways and potential to go up, that's when I get in. So it's already fulfilled my FA side for the short term. Now I'm just following it with TA side and risk management. So uh, what happened if, let's say, uh, your reverse stone, right, it suddenly went on a, on a very bearish run and it, it becomes like below three? Are you going to cut loss or are you still going to keep it? Um, I will cut loss, but definitely not when it's like below three, uh, much earlier, unless it gets down. Uh. So because mm -hmm. the share price will probably one day one, most of the time, it will, it will show some sign like MACD cross or, you know, lower low, lower high. Uh, mm. That's when you get out. So, for me, I'm using it to get in, get out, get in, get out. And it's quite interesting, man. These stocks, volatile stocks, very fun to trade on. I mean, yeah, in the past, it, recently, it, it's very boring. It is actually very fun to trade because, I mean, uh, for, for everyone, uh, I mean, Ming Tech is in my kind of like a uh, close circle. So he, he receives like my broadcast leads, right? And I've been telling him, you know, that um, I think during the first correction after the Supermax result and the Russian vaccine news, every single day was just like selling, selling, selling for like one entire week. And every single day I was buying, 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 buying. And then after that, what happened is after Top Glove result, right? After Top Glove result also had the same thing happen. It was just selling, selling, selling. But I, I mean, if you remember correctly, Ming Tech, I only told you to start buying when it was lower than the previous low, right? Then there yeah. was like a real panic, you know. You can actually feel the panic everywhere with the rubber gloves, you know. And I feel like uh, with this rubber glove, you can easily trade it whenever you feel like that freaking, uh, oh, yeah. like nervous well, gut, right? It's like, oh my God, everything is just dying. That is actually the best time to buy. When the fear is that... I agree with you on this point, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, I think my some, some of my experience trading cannabis stock uh, last time. Uh, you know how yeah. I trade cannabis stock uh, last time? Uh, because the best period of um, trading year I've ever had is uh, in year 2018, trading the cannabis stock. It's mm -hmm. a super accurate, you know. When I go in, that's like almost before the share price goes up. When I exit, that's almost before the share price goes uh, down. And mm -hmm. I only do two things. I use technical analysis and I use a WhatsApp group. But the WhatsApp mm. group that I use, uh, it's not, um, how to say, I look at the info. I just look at what's other people's reaction. Because I know in the WhatsApp group, mostly they are beginner retailers, right? Mm. And cannabis counter back then was a lot controlled by retailers. Uh. Yeah. When they were all panicking, right? And everybody mm. said, oh, let's close our laptop today. Let's not play. <laughs> Ayo, uh, don't look at it. That's when I start buying. Yeah. Everybody say, oh, I, you know, I made so much money. Oh, I come back. This is it. That's when I start trimming off my profit. I just do opposite of what everybody do. Uh, and that's how yeah. I make my profit. Yeah, it's I, very true. In Glove, currently, um, if you know how to do a little bit of analysis, I um, think it's a, it's a good, good strategy as well. Hmm. Um, I mean, okay, like for me, um, personally, I... Because I get these questions um, a lot of time, like, um, you know, which if let's say you are, if let's say you are, you still do not have any glove counter, which glove counter can you can you pick or to, whether you can still invest? If let's say you want to invest, right? And I always mention that um, if let's say you are supposed to invest in one glove counter, if let's say you give me a hundred thousand to invest in like one rubber glove counter, right? I would tell them that, you know, um, I would not actually invest in Supermax. Um, I would actually only invest either in Harta Lega, um, Top Glove, or Riverstone. Only one of these three, okay? And, um, you know, the reason is because, if not because that Supermax is um, cheap, right? Because, I mean, Supermax is very cheap. So by, by, by right, I should be going for the cheapest stock. But mm -hmm. in my opinion, um, if let's say you give me a hundred thousand to invest in one rubber glove counter, and you know, for me to hold this for over a period of let's just say six months to a year, 
right? I would definitely pick the other three, um, Riverstone, Hotel Lega, or Top Love. Um, the only reason why I do that is number is because I just feel like these three, the quality of their earnings is um, is more sustainable, and it it comes it it breaks down it breaks down towards um, number one the management and the business model relationships with clients um, and just the sheer innovation and technology of their production. Um, all these sort of things, lah. <clears throat> yeah, I wouldn't. I mean, a lot of people also wonder, you know, why not Kosan, right? But I think for me personally, <sighs> Kosan is like Kosan is like a follower, you know. Like if you remember last time when I was when when we had our live um, in April or May, I told you that I had two rubber glove counter, which is uh, sorry, I had three: uh, Riverstone, Kosan, and Top Glove. But yeah. ever since I took profit entirely on my Kosan, I realized that Kosan is a little bit of a laggard. Um, and Kosan, although they have clean room gloves, which actually is very much in demand right now, and which is exactly why I choose Riverstone over Kosan. Maybe later, you a bit, why, is River, why is clean room glove so in demand? But you continue your point first. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so that is why I would pick Riverstone over Kosan. And I also feel like another or oh, another another strong point that you need to consider also is basically um, the generation, like who is actually managing the company, right? I feel like um, in terms of generation wise, uh, you know, I feel like Kosan, uh, I mean, the Tansri is uh, is a little bit older, and who is going to take over after after him? It's still a little bit of a question mark, you know. Um, but at least. We know Hatta Lega, the sun is the, the sun is already running it. Um, and Top Glove, there is plenty of capable people of doing it. Um, and Riverstone, I think um, the owner is still not very old as well. So uh, I think there is still uh, a longevity in that sense. Yeah. Um, so in terms of uh, long-term investment, great um, glove stocks, right? I think mm -hmm. even since before COVID, many people already identify out uh, Top Glove, Hatta, and Riverstone. But Riverstone actually don't get a lot of love uh, because they are in Singapore and not a lot of people look at it. And they're sort of like a Singapore discount. And now everybody say, oh, if Supermax go and lease in Singapore, would they get better pricing, um, better valuation? Actually, this one is very uncertain uh, because if you look at Riverstone, you will know already. It's actually not very much love there. Not as much as in Malaysia. So I don't know whether... You know, this will push up the valuation of Supermax as well. But maybe you can share a little bit, why is the glove, the clean room glove uh, special, uh, higher in demand now? Is it related to COVID or is it more on tech? It's more on tech. Um, because, uh, you know, I think clean room gloves all this while, um, during, okay, so I think everybody needs to understand um, that there are different types of gloves. You know, um, even sometimes it is actually quite comical um, that there are some news in the newspaper of like a listed company who wants to take over a glove to become a rubber glove manufacturer. But it's quite comical in a sense that when they target these rubber glove players, right, they, they are not even producing healthcare gloves. They are, for instance, producing some gardening glove or industrial glove and all this sort of thing. So you know that, you know, these are the sort of, they are totally different. They are not healthcare gloves. It's not compatible, right? What we are looking at and what has been um, in demand is basically healthcare nitro glove. So that's very much in demand. Um, <clears throat> but for Riverstone, they actually have, um, I think if I'm not mistaken, I cannot remember. I think either 10 or 20% of their production is in clean room gloves. Now, clean room gloves um, on normal occasion is always being sold to... Um, uh, technology manufacturer like all the all the semiconductor guys right because these are the glove that is being used in like clean room level 100 or 1000 um yeah so that is clean room glove lah. and as you guys know nowadays um, a lot of tech stocks and tech manufacturing stocks are on the rise and i think that has finally moved the prices of clean room gloves off late and I think this price of clean room gloves 
um, is very sustainable. Yeah. Maybe you can share a little bit uh, on, on the tech side. Uh. Actually, I've been looking uh, on the tech stocks also. Uh. I don't know why is their revenue and uh, earnings having a catalyst, especially right now. Is it a coincidence or did this whole pandemic thing sort of accelerated the the tech stocks? I, I can't see the correlation. Wait. The pandemic will accelerate them. Sorry, uh, Mingtek, you, you broke out a little bit. Uh, what, what, what's, your, what's the question again? My question is, why would the tech stocks uh, suddenly have more revenue, more profit in this period, uh, as in the Malaysia manufacturing tech stocks? What is the thing driving them? I, I don't see why the pandemic will suddenly boost the thing that, you know, uh, boost the demand of these tech stocks. They are not the software stocks, you know. Mm -hmm. They are not the online work from home stocks. They are the tech stocks. So those are ma making electronics, all this. Yeah. Why, why is the acceleration right now? Um, I think a big, I think definitely a big part of it is the US China trade war. Mm. Um, I would say that is that's the biggest part of the reason why. Maybe let me just give you an example of a stock that has been discussed quite heavily in Stockbit of late, right? It's basically Pi, P-I-E. It's an example. I just want to give you an example. Um, so for instance, Pi. Um, so there is a verified user in Stockbit who, who is very bullish on Pi. And the reason why is because the parent company of Pi, which is uh, Foxconn, they, um, they because of the U.S.-China trade war, they actually have shifted the production of uh, PlayStation and Nintendo into the Pi in Malaysia. And therefore, right now, because of that particular uh, windfall, um, right now the, the, the company is you know, manufacturing this uh, and the factory is very busy 24-7 manufacturing PlayStations and Nintendos and all that. So um, I think this is just an example. This is just an example. And there are a lot more various stocks which are facing the similar um, trend. <clears throat> of course, these are the EMS players. Like, of, uh, other than that, if let's say you're talking about the HDD players uh, like Dooku and all that, we, we, we all know why um, these guys have um, kind of like a strong demand and why their prices search is because uh, just just plainly due to the uh, dig oh, yeah. digitalization of and the internet era, um, the, 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 you know, the speed of the internet era or the adoption of the internet era and digitalization due to COVID. Yep. Are you invested yeah. in any tech stocks being tech? In Malaysia? No, oh, but in yep. US, yes. In US, yes. It's like what first I'm... line for manufacturers as well. No, not in manufacturers, uh, but in oh, yeah. software stocks, Square, C Limited, CrowdStrike. Uh, all these are really, Be because if I'm investing in US, right, usually it's more for long term. And mm -hmm. I look at it as a really, really secure, really, really, uh, solid long-term counters, right? Mm. Maybe later, if we have some time, we can share, talk a little bit about that. Um, but mm. maybe, because this time you were talking about PIE, right? Uh, maybe mm. let me check the PIE. Uh. I'm sure, you know, based on the surface, uh, people will look at the PIE and it will look expensive, right? Is it? Mm. PIE? Yeah, P ratio 28 something. Because many people may not know about this PlayStation being uh, made here, all these things. In, in fact, uh, I also didn't know. <laughs> yeah. I only found out like uh, recently because of Stockbit, uh, you know, because Stockbit is a place where people kind of like share contents. Yep. So, uh, yeah, I sometimes I get a lot of my information from Stockbit. Lah. Yeah, also Joho Tin that you shared with us. Mm -hmm. Are you the one that, yeah, Joho Tin, you are the one that shared with me, right? Uh, yeah. Yes, so, yes. that's why, guys, uh, if you want to go and find out more information, like all this special information, right? To catch stocks are uh, that based on FA, uh, you wouldn't know why the share price is going up because it haven't been shown in the uh, result and report yet. And especially Malaysia company, a lot of it, uh, they actually don't tell you everything that they are doing, right? Mm. On this, maybe they'll tell you when the quarterly result is out. So Stockbit is a very good place for you to start to get this kind of uh, information. So if you'd like to follow Rondi on Stockbit, 
you can go to the link above, right? Oh, the link. Also. Yeah, I already put the link there. You just click the link, um, create an account and follow Rondi, and uh, he will share a very interesting thing with you. Okay, anything else to share about glove stocks before we move on to uh, tech counters? Anything you want to share with the follower? Because there's a lot of questions coming in, uh, but everybody's asking about what's an uh, intrinsic value, right price to buy River Stone, um, how about um, OK Plus? I think all these, uh, they can find all this information in Stockbit, but it's also not convenient for us to share, la, like, because everybody have their own uh, price point. La. Yeah, again, I think for gloves, it's um, coming back to my earlier point uh, where I laid out whether you are going to be for gloves or against gloves. Um, it's it's really up to you on which side you are going to be on. Um, of course, if let's say you're going to enter at a price which is around right now, um, your risk is higher than, for instance, myself or those people that had uh, entered much earlier. But there is definitely still a case for glove, in my opinion. Um, I think, I believe that, you know, the previous all-time high, especially for the first-tier counters, um, I personally think that they will be toppled. I think they will be toppled. Um, yeah, I just, I just, I just have, a, I, I feel strongly that they will be, they will actually achieve new highs again. Lah. I'm not sure whether it's going to be next month or um, next quarter, but I do have a feeling they will, they will be, um, they will, they will come to a point where it's going to reach a new high. <clears throat> yeah. I'm mixed on that because even though I believe that well, the earnings trend will be super strong and based on the valuation from the port, it looks super cheap. But I don't know how yeah. the market will react when there's a vaccine news, right? Because yeah. as you know, market, if no matter what's the FA, if market want to throw, they will just throw. They don't look at anything when they want to throw. Right, yeah. just like back in March. So market can overreact. So I really I mix, but that said, I believe that right now uh, the gloves are a little bit beaten down, and I feel that you know now is a, a bit of opportunity to collect them while they are cheap, right? While they are still not you know as high, and they have been sideways for some time. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of the share need to go up, then sideways for some time before breaking up game one. So we have we will see from that. But for me, I will always follow TA. TA for me now on gloves is my number one guy. But maybe here you can share a little bit on AC Apply. This AC Apply just released result today. And uh, uh, yeah. Um Asia Apply result, I think it's it's okay. It's good, but it's not it's not bombastic. Um I mean it's not like 7 million or 8 million which is uh, you know that would be that would be quite a, a statement lah. but I think 4 million is okay 4 million is within expectation um, with Asia Ply I think this is a counter that um, have actually shifted in a sense that last time it was a counter that was on the down but uh, COVID happened and really because of COVID they actually um, are entering into a, a, a transformation phase um, in a sense that now this stock, you know, you can actually see there is actually a, a clear earnings visibility even for Asia Ply until I would say the first half of next year. Um, I think it's a stock that you can just put on it, lah. Um, especially if your entry price is low. Yeah. Thank you, Randy, for sharing. How about Lock Chemical Titan and maybe Lux Chem? You mean LC Titan? Uh, I mean, LC Titan from the very beginning, uh, I mean, I know that LC Titan recently has been um, on the uptrend until today, but I <clears throat> I personally didn't invest in LC Titan um, at all because I I don't know, I, I shared in Stockbit, you know, the, the spread level between NAFTA and polyethylene. I, I saw people talking about, you know, how this this particular quarter, they can reach like 300 million of net profit and all that. But when I saw the spread of NAFTA and against the polyethylene, the PE and NAFTA, the spread, um, I was comparing it to basically those quarters in which they have at least 200 million and above, right? And when I compare it next to each other, I just felt that um, 300 million is a little bit of a stretch. So that's why I thought that this probably is just um, a good counter to trade 
because of the stories that has been carried around. But if let's say there was too much hype on it to achieve such a, a result that is probably um, it was to, yeah, it was difficult to, to achieve like, in the first place. Yeah. I mean that but that's that's just my personal uh, viewpoint now. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, so let's move on to tech counters, right? What are the um, US tech counters that you have been buying? I know you have been talking about Tesla for the longest time. You've been saying Tesla, Tesla, Tesla. Even in our retreat, like one or two years ago, you've been telling, buy Tesla now. Tesla is a super cheap, super cheap. You were telling about Tesla when it was about $200 before before the share split, you know. <laughs> yeah, I've been talking about Tesla since 2018. I think... Yeah, <clears throat> times, you know, going up. Yeah. And I think in 2019, during Ming Tech's retreat, I went there and Tesla was like trading at 170. I was actually okay. underwater. I was like 50% underwater on Tesla. <clears throat> and I just keep telling people, yeah, just buy, you know, it's um, it's a generational stock. It's a big disruptive stock, right? And um, just buy and have some faith and you will see that the market will finally understand that what it's trying to do. Because for the longest time, people are looking at Tesla um, as if it is just a car manufacturer, right? But I feel like especially this year, especially this year, people had started to realize that Tesla is not just a car manufacturer, right? It, okay, personally for me, um, investing in Tesla is uh, definitely the biggest portion of my portfolio. And the reason why is, let me just, let, let me just share with everybody is because um, Tesla is one counter that you invest in, which basically you, you feel like you're investing in eight to nine counters, right? Because Tesla is, okay, ultimately, I, in my opinion, Tesla is an energy company first. They're an energy company and they sell a family of products that, number one, consume energy, which is cars, right? Number two, produce energy, which is solar. Right. Number three, they store energy with the battery, right? So these are like the trifecta on why I invest in Tesla and why Tesla is more than just a car company. It is actually all this particular, I mean, all this uh, is an energy company and it covers three different types of um, processes in and uh, chains in the energy industry. And not only that, it is also um, a technology company it's basically internet on wheels, right? It's basically uh, an autonomy and self-driving. Yeah. So again, as I mentioned, I feel like investing in Tesla is investing one company, uh, sorry, investing nine companies in one company, <clears throat> nine startup companies into one company. And yeah, I think that's the, the realization that the market uh, had this year, and therefore the stock just went off the roof. Lah. But is Tesla <laughs> worth buying now? Did you did you buy Tesla at all, Mintek? No. Uh, why don't you, you know, I, I understand you trade on options, right? Yeah. Yeah, why don't you just like sell a put on Tesla or something at an at a interesting price? Very far or near? Up to you, <laughs> Whatever, whatever price that you feel you you, you want to buy the company. <laughs> the, the reason why I haven't got into Tesla is I haven't actually been able to calculate what's the rough value of the company. Is I know it has very good potential, but I cannot put a value on it. So mm. if I were to go into Tesla, for me, it will be just buy a bit, a bit like the method that you uh, mentioned. Just buy a bit over time, no matter what price. Just buy a bit over time, right? Yeah. But for the uh, because I have counters that I know, okay, this will be the value at least will be here and it's very mm -hmm. attractive now. So I rather trade those counters than Tesla. I know Tesla is good, but I do not know what's a right value or what right price to go in. But for yeah. the other C limited, crop strike, those I really understand and I can place a value on them and I can really see a very uh, clear visibility into their next three or five years. Yeah, so um, I agree. I, I personally also can't really wrap my head around the valuation of Tesla. Um, but I think, 
um, that in itself is not really a bad point, right? It's it's the same point as if how the biggest risk of Tesla is Elon Musk. If let's say Elon Musk is no longer there, then what, what are you going to do as a Tesla investor? I felt that a lot of people think that that is a bad point, but in my opinion, that is actually a plus point in a sense that I want to invest in a company where, you know, um, the leader is, I mean, I want to invest in him, you know, uh, so that's, that's that. Um, yeah, I, again, it's very difficult to wrap around the valuation of Tesla. You really need to understand the business and what it is trying to disrupt, you know, um, Okay, let's just talk about automotive industry, right? Automotive industry, um, how many trillion dollars uh, industry is that, right? So Tesla is trying to disrupt onto that. And then auto autonomous driving, you know, there has not even been, it, it is still an uncharted territory. And Tesla is definitely beating Uber and Google or Waymo into, and Amazon into self-driving. Um, what is going to be the value of self-driving? How can you value? Okay, for instance, I'm not sure if, you, yeah, I'm not sure if you have any friends in in US, but I do have a few good friends in US, and they or they they recently bought a Tesla like Model Y, right? So they actually really drove all the way from San Francisco all the way uh, from San Francisco all the way to New York, and they can tell me that just along the highway, it is just only on autopilot, and uh, the amount that they are willing to pay for that convenience for that stress-free driving, you know, it's, it's um, you know, you can't, you can't really put a cash figure into that, right? So um, I think there is a big value in, t in terms of autonomous driving. <clears throat> Even Elon Musk himself said that in, in his latest um, earnings release, um, which is a few weeks ago, um, he actually mentioned, you know, uh, because a lot of the Wall Street analysts are talking to him about the margin of the cars, the margin of this and the margin of that. But he actually uh, said things, what did he say, man? He, he specifically mentioned something like this. He said, like, all these margin talks that we are all having, they are all going to look comically small when you factor in autonomy, you know? So um, Tesla is like a, it's a mission statement company, right? Number one, they are really trying to make a uh, vehicle goes um, electric EV, right? That's number one, that's, that's their mission statement. That is why there is no such thing as um, average selling price to go up all the time. There's no such thing as that because on, on the contrary, he actually is trying to reduce the average selling price. So there is more uh, people who is uh, moving into electric vehicle. So that's number one. And number two, in terms of the margin, yeah, the margin from the cars are probably going to be squeezed. Uh, but the big, uh, the big profit, um, kind of like uh, Pandora box, is going to be from autonomous driving because these are really fat margin businesses going forward. Um, so in terms of valuing Tesla, it's very very difficult to wrap your head around it. But for me, I just, I just actually ask myself a question, you know. Um, my, the, the question that I ask myself is just, do you think that in 10 years time, Tesla is going to be a $1 trillion market capitalization company? And, you know, if I look into the company, I look into the people who is working into the company, all the smartest people um, in US, right? All the smartest engineers, all the smartest scientists, they all wanted wants to work for Tesla, okay? Um, so the smartest people are in Tesla, right? And they are so laser focused on what they are trying to achieve. Um, and they are just so disruptive in terms of what they are trying to do. Um, yeah, I just, then after I compile everything and I just feel like, yeah, I think I believe that in 10 years time, Tesla can definitely be a $1 trillion company. But here comes the argument from I'm not a bear, I'm not a Tesla bear, okay? I just want to be clear out there. I'm not a Tesla bear, I'm not a rubber glove bear. I think there's a price for everything. Um, and in fact, I very much love Tesla and I think Tesla will definitely, at this point, based on the knowledge I know, autonomous driving, they are going to eat the whole market already because they are so far ahead of all the other people. In terms of the electric car also, I think it's very difficult for another competitor to come in 
because they have these economies of scale thing, including their autonomous driving and also yep. their battery technology. They are always thinking how can they make the thing cheaper by innovating. I think they are very far ahead of all the competitor, very difficult to find. Just that one thing is, um, even mm. if they become a trillion dollar company in 10 years time, uh, it's only a double, you know, based on mm. the current share. Double yeah. in 10 per annum is like 7% return only. Mm. So they need to like become 4 trillion company for us to have a 20-30% return per year. Yeah, that one I'm not so, that's so that's why, why maybe you can scale your entry line, like um, you know, um, whenever it drop, then you can buy again because it's not gonna be a linear, right? It's not gonna be um, a straight line. So I just I just feel like it's a company that can definitely um, invest in uh, for the long term. Like yeah. this is this is probably the real uh, buy and hold company that I have. You know yeah. this. Uh, I mean, rubber gloves is not a buy and hold. It's a thematic investment. But counters like Tesla, I, in my, my opinion, is a buy and hold counter. <clears throat> um, but one thing with Tesla, I'm not so sure whether the share price will be as volatile as last time. Because I realized that it's a big shift in the sentiment towards Tesla this year. For some reason, the fund managers have gotten in and they believe their story now. So it's not like last year where everybody was shopping. Uh, I, let me let me correct you on that. I don't think the fund managers believe in Tesla. I think the retailers believe in Tesla. I think is Tesla it? is very much a retailer. Yeah. Managers, they, are, they are still skeptical. I think fund managers definitely are finally um, see the big picture, but um, the surge in Tesla shares is very much driven by retail, in my opinion, because oh. um, you know, if if let's say because Tesla feels like. Um, Tesla is like a Kim Kardashian of, of the stock market. Everybody is just talking about it, right? So um, when everybody is talking about it, everybody is just looking at it, and all the retailers are just really buy the story, and it just went off the roof like, in terms of the price movement and the price appreciation. Um, yeah. Oh, and I, I, I actually have another theory as well, you know. Um, maybe, yeah. Uh, I have a theory in the sense that what is how how you perceive in terms of valuation, right? Imagine if let's say you are in the US, okay, and in the US, uh, do you know like do you know what is the interest rate in the US? Zero point two five percent for the base rate for the uh, banks, but I think probably one percent if they are putting yeah. it in the bank. If let's say you you put into an FD or maybe if, even in a ten year treasury uh, bond. Yeah. What, 0.8%. I invested yeah, so, in the bank. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is that, right, for people in the US, um, if let's say you are in, investing in a risk-free um, asset, you're only going to be yielding about less than 1%. If let's say you're you are taking that particular interest rate and you, you imply it into a PE ratio, that is basically a PE ratio of above 100, you know. Okay, yep. so what, what does that mean? Because of, if let's say you're, you're implying a PE ratio of above 100 on a risk-free asset, right? Um, in terms of valuation of what is cheap, then um, this actually have elevated everything into the next level, right? Um, so if let's say you imagine yourself as, a, as, as an American, if let's say you're not investing in stocks, what are you, what you, you going to invest in? Are you going to just hold your cash and put it in the bank? Would you rather be stuck in a stagflation in basically a negative real interest rate in terms of your purchasing power, right? Or do you actually, would you rather bet on a techflation? Like, you know, um, a techflation is um, equity and tech, the, the, the tech equity, right? Um, would you be investing in like a growth game? Um, because well, if for me, I would rather be doing that because I feel like equity and tech is uh, of more value in terms of their growth than a worthless fiat currency. You know, yep. um, that's that's yeah. another way of it. So, yeah. hey, maybe next time we talk about crypto, but we don't have time for today to talk about crypto. But crypto yeah. is very interesting because even um, Square, PayPal, they are now 
buying some crypto and they are accepting crypto. So yeah. that is a very interesting discussion. I really don't buy into crypto, sorry, but I may be wrong, just like how I was wrong with not wrong, la. like I don't really no, uh, 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 I, so, I think I think you need to you need to get you need to get your ass into cryptocurrency. La. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I finally believe in crypto story. Seriously, this year. <clears throat> hey, um, next time we have a discussion on crypto, uh, let me know. I'm not the expert in it. I'm not the expert in it, but oh, yeah. uh, I'm not the expert in it. Uh, but I, I just see a fundamental change, lah. You know, and I feel like, um, I feel like there is a space for cryptocurrency and gold. Basically, any other commodities other than fiat currency. In your in in anyone's portfolio yeah okay but that's so, that's the time <laughs> maybe you can you can invite a crypto expert i also want to understand more about it i have a few in mind uh, and i may invite them so anyway mm -hmm. uh, maybe another reason why uh, tesla is going up is could it be because people finally see their car on the street and a lot of people using the car on the street and autonomous that's so why they're like oh finally realize the thing has materialized in front of them just like how the rubber glove are. people don't believe they now see the profit they start believe um actually I, that one i don't know i mean maybe <laughs> yeah maybe so, uh, maybe maybe we take a few questions from the floor yeah uh, it's already uh, then in five maybe to ten minutes of questions yeah there are a lot of questions man if you look at the chat box there's really a lot of questions um some people mm. are asking why ceo asks what do you think of new Neo. Okay, I mean, I personally, um, I was very skeptical on Neo in the beginning. I was very, very skeptical of Neo in the beginning. As a matter of fact, I think I have I wrote something about Neo in <clears throat> in Stockbit. Let me just uh, let me just take a look. And then later, maybe you can comment a bit on Apple Car. Right? Where somebody is asking, how do you look at Apple compared to Tesla? Maybe. She's referring to Apple Car, which right now is just I mean, nothing <laughs> is going on with Apple Car. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on on Neo, I think personally, um, I in the beginning I was very skeptical, <clears throat> but over time I I get warmer into the idea that this Neo is finally able to overcome the production hell. You know they are finally able to produce car with uh with a prof gross profit margin i think that is very important um it could be already an inflection point because in terms i mean making cars are not easy you know like making cars are difficult right and if let's say you are finally able to make money from producing car that is already the big first step <clears throat> and neo finally had that and yeah, I think it is a story that you can uh, put into your watch list. But in my opinion, the valuation of Neo is expensive, lah. Yeah, but it's it's definitely a legit story. Like I I wouldn't even discount Neo compared to like a Nikola or something like that. Yeah. How about <clears throat> Lucid Dream? There's like a new new article saying what Tesla X engineer come out with a come out to compete with Lucid Dream. How about yeah. There's a lot, lah. I mean, take like seriously, like SPAC, like there are a lot of there are a lot of companies that is. Uh, sorry, GM, sorry. Go ahead. GM and uh, Porsche, is it how we say? I don't know. I'm not <laughs> Porsche. Mm -hmm. right? Porsche yeah. really, I can right. And then I look at um, Marquez Brownie Brownlee mm -hmm. review yeah, yeah. on. I can Bill Gates also driving it. I've seen somebody driving it in Malaysia as well. You know. And it's already on the road. What do you think uh, as a competitor to Tesla? Because they have got the brands, the, the loyal following, and they are able to produce an electric car. Maybe not as efficient, maybe mm -hmm. more expensive, but people don't mind paying because for the brand name or for the availability. Could it be a yeah. Tesla competitor? Could it be that Tesla cannot eat the whole market like people think? Yeah, I think I think there is a big misconception, you know. Um, again. Uh, coming back to my earlier point, um, there's a big misconception where people feel like a lot of the electric vehicle, the so-called Tesla killers, are actually bad for Tesla. I, I don't. I beg to differ, and I feel like even Elon Musk will beg to differ because, um, again, coming back to the point, I feel like Tesla is in the electric vehicle market. 
um, doing it as a mission statement in a sense that he doesn't he doesn't mind competition. You know um, why Tesla actually went into China, uh, and Elon Musk know damn well that when he, when he goes into China, there is going to be definitely a lot of cases of a spillover effect from his technology into the Chinese, right? But he totally doesn't mind that. Like he's not so selfish that he wants to keep everything for himself. He actually went to China because it is the biggest EV market. So he is taking he is taking all these challenges, all these newcomers face on, right? So um, again, coming back to the point, it is a mission statement. The more EV vehicles there are on the road, it is actually better for Tesla. <clears throat> okay. It's just that it's just that um, you need to. Recently, there has been a lot of like all this SPAC. It's a similar thing like a, re a reverse takeover where where like an electric vehicle startup go and buy over like a shell company, right? And go listing into the Nasdaq, raising a, a lot of millions and billions, but they actually have nothing, right? So those are very dangerous. La. Um, you need to really differentiate um, which companies are valid and which are just uh, a bluff. La. <clears throat> hey, one more thing. Uh, uh, this hmm. one, you, you're going to be, maybe you'll be like, let's shoot, shoot down this point, uh. One of the, the concerns that I have with Tesla is that uh, Elon Musk seems to, maybe I'm a bad guy, uh, seems to care more about spreading the uh, technology more than making mm -hmm. profit. More than making what? Profit for Tesla. Yeah. Yeah. Does that bother you? Because it bothered me. What if uh, he's like really so, what we can, what we say? Um, so charitable are uh, that, oh, go and use my technology, la, never mind. La. I, my goal is not to make money. My goal is to make sure, you know, we have green energy, we save mm. the world. But at the expense of Tesla shareholder not get, getting a very good return. Um, well, I think um, just as any um, company that is still developing, Tesla is, definitely, is, is not even close to maturity yet, right? Um, just as with any companies that is still developing, um, it depends on the approach that you are trying to. Um, it depends on the approach that you are trying to do. Are you trying to make as much money and be opportunistic as possible right now, or are you trying to really um, give the market uh, a chance for adoption of what you are trying to do, and then at the end of the day, only start monetizing from there, right? So um, again. For Tesla, the the business plan is actually very straight on. Like it's very clear. Number one, try and do try and give out as many cars on the road as possible. Make it as cheap as possible. And the more these cars are driving for you, the more data that you collect for the electric for the autonomous driving. And the autonomous driving, <clears throat> you will have millions and billions of miles, and this will perfect your autonomous driving. And from your autonomous driving, this is basically where you can really make the money because this, the, the margin, as I mentioned earlier, is fat and the margin are recurring, right? It's just like Apple. It, uh, it's a repeating story from Apple. <clears throat> yep. so, so I think I am not too concerned with regards to um, making profit. That's why, as a matter of fact, when people are so excited that they might be included in the S&P 500, to me, whether they are included in the S&P 500 was not relevant. What is more important is the, the balance sheet. Do they have sufficient cash uh, for them to sustain whatever that they want to achieve, right? And further, furthermore from that is, um, are, they, are they in line with what they are trying to do with their mission and their vision? So I think that is definitely more important than just showing a profit. Hmm. Now that you put it that way, I think you've got a good point, right? If I'm... Yeah. The company's boss, huh? I'd rather break even on my car, not even make any margin. But later, I, I make money from the software and it's a recurring un, almost 100% profit. Uh, that's yeah. where the is. Okay. Actually, I got a lot of things to discuss with you, Lev, but we don't have a lot of time. Next time, maybe we can hey, discuss. Maybe, <laughs> maybe now let me switch the table around because I feel like I've been talking most of the time. Why don't yeah. you share with me some good tips from US, man? You know, like... Uh... What are the good what are the good US stocks? Like I need Which some ideas too, you know. To one stock. I've not studied personally, but I asked my coach to study it and he gave the green light. Uh, <clears but throat> like 
Um, this is the first time I'm sharing about this stock. This stock is called uh, True Leaf. It's a cannabis uh, company. They, they specialize in making medical cannabis and selling it in US and in the state of Florida, if not mistaken, they have about 60% market share. And now you are like betting on the growth and the uh, mm -hmm. adoption of cannabis in US, right? If Biden wins, huh, uh, and he's more progressive, huh, so there's a bigger chance that mm -hmm. he may legalize cannabis mm -hmm. throughout the country, which actually may not be a good thing for uh, for this truly. Because the, one of the reasons why they're making so so good profit and getting so big market share is everybody that wants to smoke cannabis, buy cannabis legally, they are flying to Florida. Man. If you are legalizing it everywhere, then everybody is jumping into the game. It may cause um, pricing pressure. Uh, then nobody mm. will fly to Florida anyway. But that is a good story. The legalization is a good story, just like what it happened in uh, Canada two years ago. And this company has been growing like a few hundred percent every year. Every single quarter, they are growing 10, 20 percent quarter on quarter. They are not even glove stocks or what, you know. It's a cannabis stock. They are very well executed, very fast growth. Um, and the interesting thing is they are growing profitably. And now the valuation still seems very cheap for me, right? The only thing that I worry about is they have some accounting change, right? Whereby, you know, they devalue the biological asset. I don't understand what it means. So that, that's why I need to verify before I go in big on the stock. So that is my upcoming hot stock, the cannabis okay. company, truly. Yeah, that is one of them. The others will be some tech counters. Like C Limited, right now, if you ask me, that is my Tesla, C Limited, even though I haven't bought in big yet. I'm trying to scale oh. in. But C Limited is my Tesla now. I still feel even at the current price, it's not, not very expensive. And it has yeah. very good future in the future uh, coming because they own Shopee, Garena, as well as C Money. C Money is like dormant now almost, but the Shopee is really growing very fast. Yeah, I, I, I also have C Limited actually. Yeah. <clears throat> Square wise, I like it, but you know, I like it, but I think now the share price has overrun by a bit. Lah. So I may, I may be adding when it drops a bit. I think now people got nothing else to buy. Uh. So that's why everybody rush into the tech counters. Any counters that is growing, they rush into it. So I'm waiting for the time where they yeah. rush. Uh, that's where I go in big on the, those counters. Techflation. Uh, that's, a, that's a term that I just uh, hear recently. <laughs> I personally, um, I think I've been investing a bit like old people. I've been boy, buying into those contrarian, uh, contrarian stocks. Uh, one of my bigger holding will be uh, a bank called Bank OZK, right? You may not have heard of it. Nothing special. Uh, I, I heard about it. You mentioned it in your seminar, right? Yeah. Nothing the same special. That I was talking about Tesla in, in, in March. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But this company, uh, if you look, if you follow their quarterly result, uh, still, uh, like every time I read their new quarterly report, uh, I'm like super proud to be their shareholder, man. Very well executed. They are still having profit growth now, man. <laughs> yeah. Despite all the impairment loss, uh, they only lost very little money and they still continue to increase their dividend. Wow. I feel like this company is like investment great for me. Mm. But so, how, how, well, how well do you know or how well do you know this like bank OZK and all that? Like in terms of the well. business. Yeah. How well do you know the business um, of the US counters? Uh, for this particular company, they really disclose very um, whatever they disclose is in detail. So I think I know them quite well, right? Mm. Because all the numbers they disclose to you, that means like um, banks actually, this bank in particular is quite easy to understand because all you need to look at is what's the interest rate that they are paying people, yeah. what's the interest rate that they are receiving from their clients, what's the risk profile of their loan. And from there, you can know what kind of profit they will be making, when they will have profit growth, uh, what are the possible risks? So this bank, if you look at uh, across the industry, they have always been the reward uh, of the lowest net charge of, meaning <clears throat> of their loans that they give up, the bad loans as a percentage of their portfolio is the lowest in the industry. Always mm. consistent. Yeah. So even now also their charge of ratio is very low. 
right? And most yeah. of the we also have the moratorium period, lah. But most of the people that took the moratorium actually start to pay back the debt already. They continue mm. to pay without issue. So I see this company has been beaten down so much. Uh, interest rate already bottom, I think, unless mm -hmm. they go to negative, um, mm -hmm. and starting to reduce what they pay the client in terms of fixed deposit. So after the adjustment period, uh, I foresee this company to have profit growth as soon as next year, because the, the amount of cash in the bank has increased so much because of the all the stimulus check and all these. So next year itself, they will have profit growth already. Uh. So a company that people think is depressed, like Bank of the K, banks, nobody want to buy. The perception is so bad. Next year, when they give profit growth, uh, I think everybody will be surprised. Uh. And I don't believe that everybody would look so deep into their financial to project where they will be making next year. It's mm. a very hard company. Uh. So, yeah, that's why I, I went into this stock. And um, the way I go in is through put option. <clears throat> put option. Um, so the premium put up. Yeah, sell put, but the premium is about 5% a month. Okay. So this selling put, uh, I could make 60% every year from this stock, you know. Yeah. Not be so high premium, uh, always. Yeah. Local banks, I don't know. Yeah, somebody is asking about, Kelly is asking local banks. For local banks, I'm not that sure, right? Mm -hmm. Not that sure because local banks, I believe a lot of the bad thing haven't been factored in yet. But US, they are very fast. So that is one of the company. Bank OZK. Um, some tech stocks and another one that I've been adding almost every week. I add one, <clears throat> I buy in the minimum lot, 2,000 shares every week. It's a Hong Kong stock, right? Mm. It's a company called Naga Corp, right? Hey, you know, right? right. Naga Corp. Yeah, I know, I know. I, I give you all the details of Naga Corp. Right? Yeah, man. Hey, yeah. If, if you read the latest quarterly report, uh, they say their business is now back to 96%. I don't mm. know how they. Man. That's crazy. Eh? Yeah, I don't know how they did it. Man. <laughs> With yeah. the pandemic and international travel cannot uh, do, uh, their business mm. is back to 96%. And yet that, means, that means Cambodia doesn't need like China tourists. No, they need just you know? China tourists, so called yeah. tourists, actually businessmen there that permanently stay there. Okay. Do business there. So that's why once they reopen, uh, Everybody flood in again. Um, and right now, even though the profit, the, the revenue is back to 90 something percent, the share price is still about 50% from the previous high. Okay. I, I like to buy stocks that nobody don't nobody like, but they are mm. actually doing well, but nobody know because they are like, I all this rubbish throw aside. Uh. Mm. It's like wow, doing very well. Yeah. So how many counters do you have in uh, Hong Kong and China? Um, for Hong Kong stock, only one. This Naga Corp only. Right. You, you're 20, not invested in Tencent as well? Uh, no. It's about 20% of my portfolio, you know? This Naga Corp. Really? Wow. So that's your biggest holding, is it? No, Bank of ZK. That's about 40 to 50%. Huh? So, <laughs> so two stocks are like 60% of your portfolio? Yeah. Oh, wow. For me, and if, if I like a stock, right, if I'm really bullish, uh, I can go 40-50%. If I'm very sure of it, I can go up to 40-50%. Yeah. Okay. Okay. For me, if I want to go in like 5%, 3%, right, what's the point? If yeah. I don't believe to put 10, at least 10%, then there's no point. Man. So many stocks to monitor. Yeah. I. Okay, on that point, right, I feel like um, I agree with you in that ideally in a portfolio, you should only have maybe like less than 10 stocks. But um, somehow, I personally, even right now in my portfolio, I I have about close to 30 stocks and it is definitely too many. Lah. It's it's difficult to monitor all of them. That's why I like the level of understanding on each particular business um, as the size of, or rather the percentage of the portfolio um, is smaller. I don't really understand the business inside out. I have to admit that as well. And that is not a good thing. But I believe that, you know, um, in this kind of like uncharted territory of COVID-19, diversification is a good way of um, of managing your portfolio. Lo. So that's why I actually have, um, I have to brace myself having like 30 stocks in my portfolio. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Uh, but I have also 
about 50% of my portfolio in Malaysia and uh, some tech stocks. So those are for COVID stocks and 50% is for after COVID stocks. Yeah, those mm. who perform well after COVID, 50% is those that will perform well now. I swing trade the stocks now, like NTPM, that's about 10, yeah. 10 to 15% of my portfolio. Okay. So okay. Yeah, last question before we end, um, how do you see N Financial? The IPO price is quite high, 80, US, 80 Hong Kong dollar, right? And financial, um, I think maybe, maybe I listen to your opinion first, uh, Ming Tech. What, what do you think? Uh, before I talk about what I think, uh, let's talk about mm. the minimum entry uh, to buy the share, 2,000 shares minimum, 80, 80 Hong Kong dollar. That's about 40 times 2. It's 80,000 mm. ringgit there. Eh. Every entry uh, is 80,000 ringgit. Mm. Am I? Yeah, every entry into this fund and financial is 80,000 ringgit. So I think for most people, it's not affordable if you use a traditional way. Uh, yeah, it's 40,000 ringgit. Yeah, for mm. most people, it's not affordable. Um, and I think they are not really targeting small retailers. They are targeting people with uh, more money. Um, so that the other day when you asked me, I have a look at the uh, prospectus. Um, yeah. I haven't looked at the, the pricing compared to the, the earnings. But when I look at the earnings and the revenue trend all this, huh, it looks quite good. Eh? Mm. I don't know whether it has been priced into the thing, lah, but I think this IPO should be doing very well. Yeah, I... Um, okay, like for me, I actually subscribed um, into the IPO. I actually... Um, I mean, I tried my luck. And mine is not the third tier. I actually... Um, try to apply it in the second tier in a sense that it is one step further um, up um, be even before the price was uh, released. Mm. And the only reason is I was just um, applying it because of um, the hype that it is having. Mm. Um, in terms of whether it is expensive, I do believe it is expensive. Uh, but even fundamentally fundamentally speaking, I, I, I can't comment much also because I have never... Uh, I have never actually tried Alipay. I, I have never been to China for quite some time also. And it's just what I see in the newspaper and what I see, um, what I hear online and, and stuff. But it does sound um, attractive. La. It, sound, it sounds like a big hype on, on, on that. Have you studied Square? Yeah. So I actually was wondering, you know, uh, how does that compare to Square and how does that compare to like Stone Coal in Brazil? Um, I think Square for you are uh, for China, but much bigger. They are like Square yeah. for China, but much bigger and uh, much more powerful. Yes. The, uh, the biggest risk with this um, end listing is uh, Jack Ma. Because the uh, structure, the organization structure, the shareholding structure, if not mistaken, is very weird. Last time, uh, last check, it was weird. Mm -hmm. And um, they have to go through a lot of hurdles in order to list. The China regulatory has been giving them some problem. So that's a that's the that's the biggest thing with investing in China, uh, Hong Kong stocks, uh, with business in China. The China government can sometimes you know make you quite nervous. Yep. Agreed. Yeah. I remember there was some stock. Yeah, I invested in a, a education company called China Maple Leaf. Initially, I made fifty percent. Then suddenly one day the share price dropped twenty percent. Right. Uh, took away like half of my profit, right? Why? Because China decided to add on a new regulation in the company. Right? So I look at this trend, uh, wow, cannot eh? Suka suka add a new regulation like that, then wow, it's very, very dangerous. Uh. So that's why right. I take the money out, put into something else better. Right. Okay. Um, maybe uh, just before we leave, I just want to um, revisit something that you know, me and Ming Tech had the last time. Um, I think the, the, the last time we had Facebook Live was about six months ago, right, Ming Tech? It? Yeah, it was six months ago. And basically, uh, we, were, we were talking about, we were wondering how we should um, pursue uh, this particular downtrend in the market, right? Um, and I think during that time, I did, I did share with you, like, um, you need to come up with, like, a watch list. Right, and maybe I can share my screen. Hold on. Uh, yeah. 
Can you see my screen? Um, not yet. Okay. Maybe you can share the application window or something like that. Yeah, hold on. Uh. Yeah, but from so the audience, do you remember today's, this? Uh, yeah, I can see. Yeah, happy enjoy if you enjoy today's sharing. Yeah. Yep. Uh, maybe you can enlarge. So I think. So I think what happened? Enlarge. Is it possible? Yeah, Rondi shared uh, your watch list because this is from right. Give out the Excel. Yeah. So what I wanted to share here is, um, it's just very simple. It's it's that I think about six months ago, uh, when Ming Tik, um and I went on Facebook Live, um, we discussed on how to go about um, riding through the crisis, riding through COVID-19 crisis. And I think my answer is that uh, everybody should actually have their own particular personal watch list on as to what are the stocks that they would like to invest and nibble over um over this particular down downturn and what stocks to bargain hunt and all that and i came up with this 40 watch list and yesterday i was just going through again what has happened with regards to all the stocks in my personal watch list and i think uh, a lot of the stocks had actually done very well you know um if you average this the return over the past six months is about 40 percent um now this is not to say that um you know this is not to show off or anything but i just feel like um this approach where you know uh there's everybody should always have a strategy on how to manage their portfolio um, and how to manage their money and where to invest right and i believe in always having a watch list in a specific timeline um, will help you massively in your in your trading journey lah. Again, you can you can take a look at this um, in stock bit. I think I mentioned I mentioned it over here. Maybe I'll put up the link yeah. to your yeah. stock bit account. Yep, guys. Um, if you like to look at the watch list, you can now go to stock bit and follow Rondi at his personal mm. account here. Yeah, and he's actually very active in doing sharing. Uh, and uh, a lot of the stock ideas that I get actually from him. So I think it's really good. Uh, once I know you, know Lucas, right? I can bounce ideas with you guys, look at what you guys are doing. It really makes my trading journey much easier. So I know that, hey, Mingtik, so yeah, maybe just uh, last few from me, right? I know that you, you, you have been uh, mingling around with um, a lot of the investment gurus as well, um, mm -hmm. especially from the Chinese-speaking ones and whatnot uh what what like what is their or rather what's the general consensus um with regards to what they feel um they should do or rather like what um layman investors should do right now you know uh, now we are already six months post the crisis how how should you um position your portfolio from now <clears throat> mm, if i look at what the other gurus are doing a lot are still very bullish on the rubber glove stocks mm -hmm. right i feel like they have still got a lot of room to go and uh, everybody else is betting on growth so everybody is rushing into tech stocks and rubber glove that is still the trend now and um people believe do you think that? that's a wise do you think that's a wise idea um i could be wrong um, and I've been wrong so many times, so I don't dare to speak so much. But I personally, I am positioning for something that I'm more sure of, which is the end of COVID. Mm -hmm. Because um, maybe I've been ingrained by reading so many books to be a contrarian. So I like to go mm -hmm. where people avoid uh, and find some gems there. I think that is safer rather than chasing the growth stocks now. A lot of the growth stocks, yes, they are growing very fast now, especially because of the COVID helping them, um, boosting their earnings. Like maybe Shopee now have a super fast growth. Uh, maybe some Fastly CDN have fast growth. Maybe even Square. All these have very fast growth. 
But this fast growth is because everybody is rushing to the, you know, uh, to digitalize their stuff, man. But after this, will the growth rate be as fast? Definitely no, man. So you cannot factor that as a normal growth rate in the future, right? If you grow like 26%, keep growing double, double, eventually you, you're bigger than the world already. It cannot be. So I think um, you need to learn how to be aware of these kind of things. Um, don't always look, don't always think that, you know, something that is growth will always keep growing. And it's not the first time uh, you look at tech counters, uh, there are periods where they are doing very well. And there are periods where they are having earnings growth, all these are, uh, and yet share prices are coming down. So I think you don't need to jump all in into them now. You can still go in in batches. Um, the most important is don't need to FOMO. Uh. Something has already gone up so much. Uh. Yep. Uh, it can still go up, uh, but your risk is definitely way higher. Okay. Maybe I'll just add a little bit about my personal viewpoint mm -hmm. um for me personally uh for me personally number one is um right now we are actually moving into a very volatile market um with all this political noise and and whatnot right so i i personally am trying to increase the the cash the cash position of my portfolio that's number one as a matter of fact um this year, I have been selling a lot of stocks. I have actually been selling Tesla because due to my due to the gains in Tesla and rubber gloves, um, I at, at one particular point of time, I was so long in terms of the equity to cash ratio that I actually have to sell them. Um, yeah, so doing the portfolio balancing, I had to like sell some of these counters. Um, but, but yeah, not right now, I feel like if let's say you have a portfolio, try and uh, be prepared for some sort of a sell-off in the market because historically historically when we see like the u.s presidential election there could be some sell-off initially so um that's number one um number two i feel like um especially in the in malaysia um people should try and position themselves not just um be fully invested in malaysia i think there are a lot of companies um, out of malaysia in the u.s in hong kong and all that um, I feel like in terms of diversification, you need to get out of Malaysia. That's number two. Because um, the the ringgit, our ringgit is um, it's a high-risk currency in a sense that it can easily depreciate, especially with all the all these like political instability and all that. Um, you know, there there are, there are like noises about how the credit rating agency is going to again downgrade our sovereign rating and whatnot. All these are high risk into the ringgit. So that's number two. And um, number three is, yeah, I think um, you can, you should always, you should be investing in, it, it should be a balanced portfolio now in a sense that you should be investing in companies that has very good earnings um, visibility, i.e. like the rubber glove stocks. Um, and then you should also be invested in, you should try to um, tilt your portfolio into, um, counters that has also both um, very good earnings visibility and at the same time has a good value, you know. So these are basically your counters like uh, Denons. Um, I think Denons is quite good. Um, what know, else? Um, hopefully, we can get the management. Mm. And um, some Hong Kong stocks. There are a couple which are good as well. Um, yeah. And. There are some thematic investment as well, like for instance, the furniture, right? The furniture stocks, um, actually, they, they had a shift in fortune of late. Um, so, and they're all very cheap, you know, I think Homerates and Lehan and all that, they are all trading at X cash PE ratio of below 10. So maybe um, this can be of considerations as well. Um, so th those are basically counters with earnings visibility. Next is, um, in my opinion, personally for me, I am right now shifting towards a lot more. I mean, I'm shifting also some portfolio allocation to like long-term defensive value stock, as well as like a little bit of like turn around or like oversold bid down stock as well. Maybe you can share some some names. Okay, like long-term value, long-term defensive value stock, in my opinion, are counters that are like um, Johotin, um, counters that are like uh, MFCB, I, I would consider MFCB as another one. And turn around, beaten down stock, um, 
perhaps a counter like Petronas Chemical. Um, even in the US, you can probably take a take a look into like Booking.com or Walt Disney or, or this sort of counters. Lah. And yeah, and lastly, of course, in my opinion, um, you should have a portion of your portfolio as well in um, alternate investments. So things like Bitcoin and gold and, and, and this thing. So yeah, it, it should be like a well balance between cash and equity. And in terms of equity, it should also be spread out. Uh, so you, you think that in the next few months, it will be a bit more volatile, that you are more, you are, you, that's what you think in the next few months, it will be more volatile and it's wise to have some cash. Is that the point that you want to bring across? Yes, yes, yes. And be invested in good fundamental stocks. You know, um, I know that this year, um, especially in Bursa, we, we really have, you know, a very crazy hyper stock uh, exchange like in the KLSC in a sense that so many Goreng counters Goreng like crazy also like what the heck is happening to like I, I mean I'm not sure if you guys follow my stock bit but you know your, uh, uh, we made like crazy amount of money from like HLT la, SRAM la, all these like notion even right it's like oh my goodness beyond imagination kind of like uh, return you just close your eye you hit also you like it just goes up like crazy <laughs> And um, yeah, but I think it's it's about time now that you know um, things are starting to slow down, uh, volatility are coming up again, um, and it's good to be defensive once more, lah. Okay, mm. thank you for your um, tips and uh, outlook. I think this is a super super value gem pack sharing, man. <laughs> thank you to you, you Mingtek. Thanks to you, actually. So next time, I hope the next time we do a live will be with Denounce Management. Or else then, um, maybe one day, a um, few months later, we can revisit again. But yeah, interesting idea on picking someone with expertise on crypto to share his uh, mm -hmm. view. Uh, I'm yep. also very interested. I don't see right now, at this point, I, I, I cannot see the case, like really solid case for crypto. And even if there is, which one should we pick and what platform? That's a really new market. But I've seen so many people started to go into it. Even people that in the past were skeptical, now they start to be bullish. So that's really interesting for me. And I think it's, it's like me. La, I, think, I think for me, I, I understand very little about cryptocurrency. Uh, but there is just like a big shift in, in, in the fundamental of uh, demand and supply, you know, like... Um, how can you have an unlimited supply of fiat currency, right? Mm -hmm. While uh, commodities, limited commodities such as gold and mm -hmm. Bitcoin and all this sort of thing, they are not, they're still on par in terms of value, right? So I think that that is, that is where the discrepancy is. And I feel like over time, people will start to realize this. Um, yeah, so actually that's, that's a very simple, um, explanation on why I enter into Bitcoin. It's just Bitcoin mm. and you can go through. Oh, yeah. Why don't we long go? I actually long go via eToro. You know? I think it still have plenty of upside to go. Every time after a crisis, there will be a yeah. super bull. I do have gold. Um, I'm invested in a gold ETF um, with the ticker of IAU. It's, um, I mean, it's steady. Like, it's not, I'm not making like 30% out of it. I'm only like it's a, it's a slow, uh, low double digit, but I just I just feel a lot better with um, this um, diversification in my portfolio. It just makes sense to me. <clears throat> okay, so thank you everyone for staying all the way. It's almost been yes. two hours. Actually, this can thank become too live, man. Yeah, but every time we have you, it's a super, super jam pack. Okay, Hola. have a good evening. Thank you very yes. much for sharing. Thanks, guys. See you guys around. Thanks. See you guys. Bye. Bye.